Hello, everyone. I'm Haiti O'Brien, Information Services Librarian at Richmond Public Library, and I will be your host for this evening's program, Welcome Susan Juby, a virtual author event. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that the Richmond Public Library is located. Hello. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that the Richmond Public Library is located on the ancestral territory of the Hunkamanum speaking people. As you are able, please take a moment to reflect and acknowledge the traditional territory that you are on. Thank you. In a moment, we'll be joined by our special guest, award-winning author, Susan Juby. Susan is the author of our summertime community read here at Richmond Public Library, Mindful of Murder. Susan will be joining us to talk about this fresh and funny new mystery set on the Discovery Islands of British Columbia. Susan will also talk about getting started in writing and getting published. Before Susan joins us, I have a few housekeeping notes to share. You'll notice that your mic is muted this evening and camera turned off. This is intentional to keep the focus on our speaker today. It is not permitted for participants to record the event or take screenshots. Today's session is being recorded by the library and we'll share details of how to access the video at the end of this evening's event. If you'd like to see live captioning, we have enabled live transcript. If you're interested, you may click on the live transcript button and then click show subtitles. To stop the live captions, click on hide subtitles. Audience questions will take place during the last half hour of our program this evening. If you'd like to submit a question for consideration, you can type it in the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of our screen. I'll ask Susan as many questions as we have time for. And now it is my great pleasure to welcome Susan Juby to our digital stage. Susan Juby was raised in Smithers, BC, and has lived in Toronto, Vancouver, and now Nanaimo, where she teaches creative writing at Vancouver Island University. Susan's novels have been awarded many prizes and honors. Republic of Dirt won the Leacock Medal for Humor, and the Woolfield Poultry Collective was a Leacock nominee. Susan has also received accolades for her books for young people, such as the Truth Commission, which won the Sheila A. Egoff Award for Children's Literature. This summer, Richmond residents are reading Susan's first mystery, Mindful of Murder. Susan Juby, welcome. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. Um, and I would like to take a moment now to acknowledge that I am coming at you from the traditional territories of the Snanamo people, who are the Coast Salish people. And um, this is unceded land, and I'm uh, grateful and conflicted to be here. Um, uh, and I just wanted to take a moment to thank the Richmond Public Library for um, for choosing Mindful of Murder as the summer read uh, as the, uh, you know, it's a, it's a great honor. And I'm uh, glad for all the everybody who's taken the time to read the book. And I hope that all of you are um, staying cool, that you are not currently melting. Um, I've just turned off my air conditioner, so we don't have the, the rattle of the air conditioner. So if I start to get a little shiny partway through the program, you'll probably be able to understand. Um, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, how I came to get published, about uh, the ups and downs of the writing life, and, um, and then I'm gonna talk uh, specifically about the process of writing uh, my first uh, murder mystery um, and how that all came together. Um, so to begin with, I uh, didn't write, well, I wrote fiction um, avidly until I, you know, from maybe grade two till about grade seven, I was tremendously devoted to my craft. And then in grade seven, um, I had a series of, perhaps difficult teachers, and I just sort of lost it. And uh, I also lost all the confidence that I could ever write anything interesting or important. Um, and then that was a, a fallow period uh, in my writing life. And so it took me until I was 27 to start writing again. So if any of you are um, in a period where you want to be writers, you're interested in writing, but you're having a hard time. Um, what I would recommend for you, I, I'll come back to this over the whole talk, is that you um, allow yourself to write um, whatever really badly. Like part of your job, as if any of you are aspiring writers, part of your job is to let go of all the voices that say, 
this is terrible. Who are you to try to write? Um, I remember being early in my career and having people before I was published, people say, well, I would write except for who am I to write? And underneath that is this idea, who are you to write? And so if you're going to be a writer, you kind of have to put up your hand in your own little modest way and say, I, I have something to say. Um, and so sometimes that's a very, uh, that's a very personal and private kind of thing. So what I did to get over my fear that it wouldn't be any good, um, and it wasn't. Uh, that's that's what the other thing about writing is that my early work was extremely not good. Um, early drafts of every book I've ever written, they've been pretty bad. There've been some, uh, you know, some good bits, but there's also a lot of bad bits. And as a writer, you sort of have to work through the bad bits and realize it can come out bad and you can fix it. Um, so what I did is I wrote um, on the bus on the way to work, never told anybody I was working on a novel. But those first lines I wrote when I sat on that bus became my first novel, Alice, I think. And I wrote and wrote and wrote. And then I finally gave, um, I ended up with four journals because I'd handwritten it. So I brought my four journals. Um, I didn't drive and I brought them to my godfather in Salmon Arm on a bus. Um, and I just handed them over. You know, here's the secret thing I'm working on. Um, and he didn't... Um, you know, run away screaming or anything. He took it and he read it and he said, oh, you know, that's, he read a little bit and he said, oh, Susan, good for you. Way to try, girl. Um, and he said, sometimes when we really love a writer, we write like that writer. And what he meant is that the book uh, was derivative. <laughs> and it was derivative because it was very much inspired by a diary series um, called The Secret Diaries of Adrian Mole, age 13 and three quarters which is one of my all time favorite comedic novels. Um, and so I, I was quite happy to find out that I'd written um, a derivative something. Um, I was happy to have written anything, to be honest. And then a little bit later the same evening, I was woken up by the sound of peals of laughter coming out of um, his bedroom that uh, he shares with my aunt. Um, and it was because something in my book had made him laugh. And that to me was the I knew I was on the right track is I'd made somebody laugh. And that was a really, um, you know, the books that have made me laugh have um, touched me in ways that almost nothing else has. Like I read beautiful books, I read sad books, but if you can make me laugh, I am yours. Um, and so that's always been my goal as a writer is to try to make people laugh. Um, sometimes I succeed, sometimes I don't succeed. And so that first book, um, I did not have the confidence to, you know, expect great things. And so I, uh, I wouldn't probably have sent it anywhere. I worked in publishing. I worked as an editor in a nonfiction book publishing company. We did lots of books about making twig furniture and irritable bowel syndrome, um, none of which sort of translate <laughs> into fiction. But I also knew that there were a lot of people trying to get published. And those people trying to get published often ended up um, in what's called the slush pile. And the slush pile is where unsolicited manuscripts go. And it's a pretty tough place to climb out of. Um, so I, um, I would not have tried to get published if my godfather, who'd done me the great courtesy of laughing, um, hadn't said, Susan, you need to submit this manuscript. You need to try to get it published. And so he would call me every day and email me every day and say, did you submit that? And so I started submitting it and I started getting rejected. And because writers tend to be sensitive, um, each rejection was just like, oh, they didn't want it. Nobody loves me. <laughs> and of course, I took it tremendously personally, uh, which is another super um, ability of lots of writers is to take a lot of things personally. I don't think you can become a writer if you don't take things personally. Um, but eventually some uh, publisher, I could have papered this entire room that I'm sitting in with rejection notices. But eventually a publisher said, oh, we think this is really... Um, it's really weird, but it's funny. And maybe we could find a place for it. And they ended up publishing it. So it got published by a very small Canadian press called Thistledown. And uh, I'll be forever grateful to them. They published it and uh, the money that changed hands was minimal. Uh, my uh, first advance was uh, $0 <laughs> in case you're wondering about the economics. Um, but they did give me quite a bit of money for my launch party. And so I spent all of the money on free wine and hors d'oeuvres so that people would buy a lot of books and that worked out just fine. And so the first book came out and it, it found some readers and then it got nominated for some prizes. And I thought, 
oh, this is so exciting. Um, and then uh, I approached an agent. Other agents hadn't been interested in working with me, but uh, based on those award nominations, I approached an agent and she was thinking about it and she took it to New York. She took the second book in the series. Uh, I decided to write more about that character. She took the second book in the series to New York and talked to some editors in New York City about it. Um, and if, you know, and she still hadn't decided whether to sign me, but she had was on her way home and she landed. And one of the editors said, oh, we think this, you know, I think this sounds really funny. I'm really taken with this. And so that editor ended up buying three of my books and they got published all over the world. And it was sort of really interesting to go from a book that was, um, it had found some readers, but it was a very quiet sort of a, a thing um, to a book that had, um, you know, that was, you know, had turned lucrative. And when I look back now, I think, oh, all the people, and there were quite a few people who told me, you know, this is a fool's errand. You shouldn't try to, first of all, write you. And second, you should never try to get published. And third, you're never going to make any money. And, you know, people have a lot of um, their own anxieties about the creative process that they sometimes lay on to writers. Um, so I um, I ended up going from no money uh, with this book to with those books to making a living as a writer. And I've gone over the course of my career. I've been being published. I'm um, I am 53 now. So I've been published since I was 30. My first book got published when I was 30. And in that time, I've written 13 books um, and it's been up and down. Right. So it's been um, as a career, like as a financial career, it's been up and down. There's been a TV show, which was great, you know, very exciting. Some books have done very well. Some books have done less well. Um, and so I always tell my students and other people that I talk to about the writing process is that really what has to drive you as a writer is your interest in what you're writing about. Um, and that is, you know, that brings me a little bit to Mindful of Murder. Um, Mindful of Murder is a book that I worked on for almost six years to try to get it right. And it's packed full of things that are my obsessions. And so if you, um, for anyone who's interested in writing, I think that dilettante, um, kind of personality where you get into something and you just love it and you're playing in it and you're having a great time and then you're off to the next thing and then you flit off to the next thing that's actually a good um it might not be great um to become you know a super master of something but it's actually a great quality for a writer because we're not going to spend our unless we have a particular topic but for fiction writers we're not going to spend our whole lives with a particular thing um you know our hobbies yes but for a book, you disappear into things and then you come out and you get to use them in your um, in your manuscripts and, and that works out really well. So I wrote these 13 books and of them, there were some that were teen fiction and some of them that were memoir. Uh, I wrote a memoir about my lost teen years. Um, I've got two novels for adults, comedic novels, um, The Woolfield Poultry Collective and Republic of Dirt. Um, and then um, I have a middle grade novel uh, called Me Three that just came out. And then this six year project, Mindful of Murder. And Mindful of Murder came about because first of all, I love nothing more than a murder mystery. Um, I truly, truly, truly feel passionate about murder mysteries. Um, and you know, I'll talk a little bit about why that is. And I thought, I, I can't think of anything more fun or interesting than to come up with a, a, a book and a character, um, sort of a, a setup that I could turn into multiple books. Um, so I spent a lot of time thinking, oh, okay, what could I bring to this field that is unique to me? So the other thing I suggest with um, new writers is that you think about your voice. So you're probably familiar with this concept of a writer's voice. So your voice is everything you put into your piece of writing that is very particular to you. Um, and if you want somebody to say, say, oh, I fell in love with that book, what they're often falling in love with is not just the plot, not just the characters, they're falling in love with a voice. Um, and so I love what I consider voicey fiction. And it's where characters have very particular kinds of voices, ways of speaking, ways of thinking, ways of seeing the world. Um, their vocabulary, all of it is uh, creates voice. So if you're interested in whether you have a voice or not, um, ask people. Um, if you write a little bit, say, you know, can you tell that I wrote this? And that's not to say that every piece of writing should be you, right? So a, a writer with a strong voice 
they can have it mod uh, modulate from character to character, but you always know you're in this kind of a writer. So Heather O'Neill has a very strong voice, for instance. You know, it's funny, it's lyrical. She's got that way with similes. Um, and so with my students, what I tell them is, okay, so I want you to, I'll have them write something. And then I say, I want you to take out everything that somebody else could have written. Um, and then what is uniquely um, particularly you. And that is the gift that you as a writer are going to give your readers. And so I have a very particular kind of voice. It's not for everybody, but um, it's the voice that I have. And uh, so I, I have this voice, I have this setup, this psychological and artistic setup, and I needed to translate that into a murder mystery, which means that um, everything I write has humor um, sort of as a thread running through it. Um, and so there's nothing very funny about murder. Murder is not a funny thing. Um, however, people are always funny um, or almost always funny. And so I had to find a way to create a murder mystery that had a thread of humor. Uh, and that was sort of my starting place. Um, it is, um, and that's kind of where this um, cozy things come comes in. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about cozies and why, what cozies are, why they're having a moment. Um, a cozy, uh, for anyone who's not familiar with the term, is a kind of murder mystery that's set in a non sort of aggressive, it's not like an urban underbelly kind of a uh, world. Uh, cozy is generally set in a sort of a smaller, more contained place, um, a softer kind of place. Often they're set traditionally in like villages. Miss Marple is a classic kind of a, you know, one of the great cozy characters. Um, there's a group of characters who are not um, usually any kind of violence is off off the page you don't actually get ex you know you don't see um graphic murder or uh, happening there's the old style of cozy has no swearing and it has no uh sort of sexy bits um contemporary cozies have a little bit more of that stuff but they don't have the graphic violence um and so i knew i was probably going to you know i, I tested the waters a little bit should i make this have this be a little bit violent. And I thought, no, it's just not a fit for me. I'm not, um, it's too upsetting. Um, so I have, you know, there is a murder in the book. Um, you, you know, you've seen it, um, but it's not the kind of murder that's gonna give um, anyone except for the murdered person nightmares. Um, so I came up with that. And then the other thing when you're wanting to create a murder mystery, and if you want it to be a series, is it's really important to come up with um, a detective that you'd want to live with for a while. And so I came up with Helen. Um, and Helen is, um, at first, she was just a standard kind of detective. At first, Helen was just basically, she was a former police detective who becomes a butler. Um, and then I thought that's not interesting enough. And the butler thing is, you know, another passion of mine. I've been fascinated with butlers since I uh, first read P.G. Woodhouse. I don't know if any of you have ever read P.G. Woodhouse, but one of the great comic writers of all time. And in P.G. Woodhouse, a uh, Bertie and Jeeves. So Bertie is a um, he's a very wealthy young man without a lot of sense. He's very funny. He's um, not terribly competent. And then he's got Jeeves, his butler, who tries to keep him on the straight and narrow. And he's always doing things like having too many cocktails and stealing coffee creamers and, you know, other high, high, high crimes and misdemeanors. Um, and so the dynamic between this butler and the not very competent person is very appealing to me. Um, I find it really funny and interesting. I also had fantasies for a long time about becoming a butler. Uh, not because I have any skills in the butling department. I don't even have particularly good grip on etiquette, but because I thought it would be such an interesting um, way to make a living, like to be among, um, you know, people who have a lot of things that need looking after. Um, I just find that whole thing fascinating. And before I started writing this, I was at the gym and I saw some big article and I think it was like The Economist about how there's a new billionaire happening every 17 hours right now. Every 17 hours we get a new billionaire and a lot of those people want butlers. And so butlering is this new career for all these people who might have had other jobs. And so they get paid a ton of money. It used to be that butlers would train in a manor house under an established butler and they'd learn about the wine cellar and 
entertaining and all that kind of stuff. Now butlers go to butler colleges and they have MBAs. They um, know how to look after and buy art. They know how to look after a yacht. They know how to do all these sorts of things that they didn't used to do. Um, and so a butler is now an accoutrement of the very wealthy. So I thought, oh, I want Helen also to become a butler. Um, and so Helen, then the final piece that fell into uh, into place is that I couldn't figure out her background, how she got into this butlering until I was on a meditation retreat. And on that meditation retreat, I realized that the meditation teachers had this uncanny ability to um, ask questions in such a way that people would just like uh, be cracked wide open. Uh, maybe other people don't, but I'm pretty sure they do. And I would wait for my turn to go and speak to my meditation teachers after a long period of silence, you know, several days of silence. And then they would ask how it was going. And I would just confess all, even though I don't think supposed to do that. I would just tell them everything. And I thought, oh, that quality that they have of intense listening. And you get the sense that they see exactly what you're all about, whether you're saying it or not. I thought that's a great quality for a detective. So those are some of the things that um, went into making uh, making this character of Helen. And my goal was to come up with a detective who had something interesting about her. She's going to be an amateur detective as opposed to an actual detective. She's not a you know there are the categories in mystery. There's the private eye, um, then there's the police procedurals. And then there's amateur detectives. And I knew she was going to be in the amateur detective realm. And I wanted somebody that I could put into um, situation after situation from book to book. So in this situation, um, I wanted her to be at the Yatra Institute, which is um, uh, a new age retreat center. And she's solving, of course, the... Um, the murder of her former employer. Um, the Yatra Institute is based very closely on the Hollyhock Leadership Institute on Cortez Island, which is where I spend a lot of time on retreat. Um, it's an incredibly beautiful place. And because I spend all of my time there two weeks a year, um, and then often I'll go by myself. Um, so two weeks a year, meditating, walking very slowly, um, and it's it's one of those things where the the environment sort of goes inside you. You become very, very um, saturated in the environment. And so I just knew at a certain point that that's where the book had to take place. Um, I'm midway through the second book in the Helen series, and it takes place in Vancouver and on a ranch that is, uh, well, the land itself is somewhat inspired by the Douglas Lake Ranch. So I often have um, settings that I'm you know, they end up in my books because that's just where the book is happening. Um, and finally, uh, I would say that the Buddhist piece of this um, is quite important to me, even though I'm not a Buddhist of great attainment. So I write my things and then I hand over what I've written or I bring up the topics to my um, I have a Sangha here in Nanaimo that I sit with every week. In fact, they're sitting right now without me, um, probably sending me very good vibes, I would imagine. <laughs> um, and I sit with my Sangha, but I also give the, the Buddhist material to the teachers that I, like my root teachers who are uh, in um, Hawaii and they are, you know, they know a lot. And so they, they try to stop me from making some of my more egregious errors. Um, so that is, you know, those are some of the roots of the book. Um, and in terms of publishing, I, for the first book, I have the same publisher, HarperCollins, um, has been working with me on my adult work and, and some of my YA for 23 years now. And I they asked what I was working on with Mindful of Murder, and I gave them a little sample. And they bought it based on a chapter. And so then I was in the, whoa, I've got to get this written. Um, I'm doing that now. They have, um, I'm grateful that they have published two more books, uh, or pardon me, bought two more books. So um, I'm trying to get the second one done before I start teaching again. Um, and that's that's the galloping tour. And I'm uh, again, I'm really grateful for everyone who is logged on tonight. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions about writing, about mysteries, um, about anything that interests you uh, about any of this business. So thank you very much. 
Thank you, Susan, for that fascinating look at the creative process. Um, there's so much in your remarks that we could follow up on. I love the tips for writers uh, to allow yourself to write badly. Uh, keep going with those early drafts. Um, think about your voice and also uh, focusing on what's what you're passionate about, even if it's just something you're passionate about in the moment as a writer. How fun is that to sort of try on different worlds? Um, so we've got some audience questions uh, coming in. Um, just to kick things off, I wanted to ask you, mysteries are something you're passionate about. This is your first mystery. How was that different perhaps in writing, or was it different than writing some of your other novels? How was working on the plot of a mystery? Well, working on the plot of a mystery is uh, somewhat different. So when I handed in my very first novel, um, I had just finished an undergraduate degree in English literature, and it was um, the 90s, so it was everything was postmodernism. And so uh, we studied um, fragmentary plots, et cetera, but we were told that the plot itself was passe. Um, so the, that was really sort of the ethos of that time. And so I wrote this book that had no plot, my first book, none whatsoever. I didn't even try. Um, it was just a series of events that happened that I thought were funny. Um, and so I sold the book and they gave it to an editor and he said, oh, he called me up. He said, Susan, so funny, really funny. Now you need a beginning, a middle and an end. <laughs> and uh, so that has been the journey of a lifetime is, is to come up with, with arcs. Um, and then mysteries are even more particular in that, you know, you can kind of, they call them, I can't remember the name of the editor who goes to the Surrey Writers Festival, um, an editor who calls them pantsers and plotters. And so plotters know the book before they start writing. They have the whole plot organized. Pantsers do it by the seat of their pants. They just like write and see what happens. Um, and so I'm kind of a mix of the two things. So what I do now is I have a general idea for the crime fiction. A general, the most important thing for me is to like, what is the crime? Who are the people involved? I get to a certain stage, like about a third of the way in, a little bit more. And then I go and I like really nail down all the plot points. Um, and that's the point at which like, I know who did it, but that's the point at which I write what's called the plot behind the plot. And the plot behind the plot is where you write the um, murderer's story. So the, the, the culprit story. So this is the person, this is what they did. This is when they did it. This is how they did it. And this is how they're trying to get away with it. And so that whole piece is written out and I have that and I'm writing my book with that in mind. So my character is not going to know what the culprit's doing, um, but they're going to pick out some of these things. And so it's a it's a very different process in, in that you basically have two complete plots happening. Um, and you need to have... Uh, you know, mindful of murder is on the in the realm of mysteries. It's a slower kind of mystery, um, and that's that was a deliberate choice on my part. The next one's a little speedier, um, but it's still you want to have that people wanting to know what happened, why did it happen, um, and right uh, readers often want to first of all like be right alongside the detective. They want to feel like they kind of hang out with the detective a bit. And they wanted the detective to solve it, but only a little bit before they do. So readers will be very disappointed if they look at the, you know, if they say page 20, oh, I know who did it. All right. What's what's going on here? So those are some things that are different. Yeah, this one definitely kept me guessing right till the just, well, really to the reveal. It just uh, it was uh, kept me guessing, which was, was great. We've got some questions coming in from our audience. Um, what are the differences between writing for young people and writing for adults, if any? Mm, um, yeah, there are differences. So um, it sounds obvious and glib, but it's it is the the truth is that in a YA novel, so that's mostly what I've written. I've written middle grade a little bit and YA. Um, YA novels and middle grade novels are defined by the age of the characters who star who are most affected by what's happening so that means that the stars the main characters are going to be teenagers or they're going to be middle graders um in an adult novel and generally in ya the characters are undergoing what's called um in ya literature they call it the identity crisis um or um that's what people who work with teens call it too. And so that's the process of who am I, right? So 
who do I want to be? What am I leaving behind? Do I want to be like my family? Like, what's my relationship to morality and money and prestige and sexuality and all those kinds of things, gender? Um, those are the topics that almost every young adult is engaged in. And that's a really hard and dynamic and interesting thing. So you've probably mostly heard the idea that if you survive teenagehood, you have a novel in you. And that's why is because it's this real crucible time of personal development. So that's teen writing. Um, and then writing for adults, it can be more about ideas and concepts, and it's not necessarily an identity crisis thing. Um, so in Mindful of Murder, there's you know some Buddhist thematic things happening about um, the perfections, about the hindrances, about some of these Buddhist concepts that uh, will run through all of the books. Um, and also about um, like compassion, finding out, you know, we there's the self we present to the world. And then there's what's underneath that, like what, you know, what there is minus conditions. So those are some of the things that are different about the two. Um, and I really like for my YA to reflect teen voices and honest teen psychology. Um, and for the adult novels, they can, you know, there, there's just a little more leeway in terms of what you're writing about and who you're writing about. Thank you. Um, what inspired the three classes is another question we have here, the dance, the flower arranging, and the meditation. Mm. Uh, well, I am obsessed with flower arranging. <laughs> you can't tell from that. <laughs> That's, um, somebody gave me those. Those are really sweet. They're um, carnations. <laughs> That's not, it's not my best work. Um, <laughs> um, I'm not actually good at flower arranging. I'm not good at anything that I write about, to be honest. Um, but I just thought, okay, let's say you're trying to find somebody's perfections. Um, and so perfections to me, um, there are the paramis, so your generosity and all that kind of stuff. But when I think about, I wanted there to be a test that has, that are, is artistic, meaning like aesthetically artistic. So flower arranging, I wanted there to be a test that is somewhat physical. So there's the bizarre dance, the, um, you know, wayfarers dance. And then meditation, um, partly because that's what Helen does. Um, and I also needed those people um, to get still enough and quiet enough to start to open up. Um, and for her to be able to see them through the lens of the meditation interview. Um, so I wanted those three things to bring out the different aspects of each person. So, and I believe that in order to have a complete life, we need to have an artistic life. We need to have whatever form of physical life that we can have. And we also need to have, um, I mean, I should speak for myself. I sound so bossy, but for myself, I need to also have like an internal life, a spiritual life um, of just, you know, being present for the moment and seeing what's happening. Um, those are the three things that bring about um, you know, the sense that life is complete um, for me. And also flower arranging, I don't know if you know, is, I mean, dance is always great, but flower arranging, um, I read book after book after book after book after book about flower arranging. I did not know that there was this whole underbelly. It's not an underbelly, it's an overbelly of competitive flower arranging. And it's really extreme. <laughs> yes, there are flower arranging competitions, floral design competitions at the elite level internationally, where people do like flower installations. Um, it's extremely cutthroat in a lot of my books. There are weird competitions because I, I find it so funny and charming how human beings turn everything into a competition from their chickens, you know, poultry shows to flower <laughs> arranging. Aren't we the weirdest? We can't just love anything. We have to compete. Bless our hearts. Yeah. Yeah, I was just rereading that line that Helen says about uh, she doesn't want to call the what the the, the relatives are going through um, a contest. She calls it an experience. But yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Yeah. So yeah. We're having an experience, but it's very hard to stop comparing. Um, and that's something that, you know, going on retreat, I'm. I found myself uh, over the years before these interviews wanting to, like, give the impression that I was like borderline enlightened. And it was not true. I was not borderline enlightened, but there was that competitive thing in me as I want them, to, you know, the teachers to be like, wow, she's quite gifted. Um, but instead, when I open my mouth, they're very clear. I'm not <laughs> enlightened. So and I, that's a very common thing too. And so, you know, part of the process of meditation also, and Buddhism is just like, 
kind of having a little affection for all of our awfulness. Like, you know, we're good and we're bad. And if we can have some affection for all those parts of us um, and Helen sort of can, uh, which is something that I like about Helen. Yeah, that's great. And that's certainly infused throughout the book. Um, so I'm just checking our other questions coming in here. Um, I've read a couple of your books and loved your quirky characters. Do you base your characters on actual people? No, not. Um, my first book had, you know, it was certainly more uh, Mr. Potato Head from different people I know. Um, so I was drawing from different, um, but as time has gone on, oh, I might have a little flavor of this person and a little bit of that, you know, a quality or a look from this person. But generally my characters are, um, for the most part, they're people that I would want to meet, uh, people I would find interesting, um, whether they're pleasant or unpleasant. I'm just really interested in people who are extreme in some way. Um, I love an eccentric, even though, you know, a lot of the people in my books, you wouldn't necessarily want to like be roomies with them or anything. <laughs> they would be, they'd be quite exhausting, but they're really fun to write. And, you know, comedy often has a lot of peculiar characters and they'll also be one person who's kind of the, like an anchor or a foundation kind of person. Like Helen is that where she's a steady Eddie and everybody around her is eccentric. Same thing in the Wolfield Poultry Collective. Um, there's, you know, uh, a, a sort of a straight person and then everybody else is very, um, peculiar. Um, and I'm also, you know, voice, um, part of my voice and part of my view of life is that there is, um, somebody for everybody, like a group where those of people who don't fit in easily are going to be welcomed and appreciated. Um, that may be wishful thinking, but um, that's what that's what my heart wants to believe. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds good. Um, question about your writing process. Do you try to write every day? Yeah, uh, definitely. Right now, as I say, I'm trying to write um, every day because I'm trying to get a first draft. So that's 80,000 words um, written over the summer, which is not something I've ever done before, but I am writing, 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 writing. Um, and I think that's what mystery writers do. The ones who do a book a year is they write every day and they write quite a lot. Um, and so I have been more or less writing every day, just not as much as I am right now for 23 years. Um, so once I got writing, I was afraid to stop. Um, I just really, you know, I, and I have no shortage of ideas. It's just idea city up in here. And I just need to like pick one or two, um, I have often written one book or two books at a time. So I'll often write one particular book in the morning, mm -hmm. take a break. And this is true, whether I'm writing or and teaching, whatever. So one book in the morning, take a break, and then the other book in the afternoon. Um, and I need the break in between so I can adjust my sort of um, my mental framework and my energy. Um, and they have to be different enough, the two books that I can keep the voices straight and so forth. But that I've done that a number of times now is written two at a time. Um, and yeah, so I, I love it. I, it's, you know, I don't always love it, but I feel good. If I have a good day and probably those of uh, here who, who write know that if you write a good scene that you're happy with, your whole day is gravy. It's like, whatever, I'm look at me. I just finished, you know, a, sometimes that happens by like seven, you know, I'll get up at five and I'll write until seven or eight o'clock. And then be like, the rest of this day is mine. It is mine. <laughs> uh, I, I feel so good about it. Um, and even if the writing goes badly, you can just tell yourself, you wrote. It's okay. Even if it's garbage, <laughs> you got it down. That's right. Allow yourself to write badly, right? <laughs> yeah, that's great. Is that unusual that for authors to work on more than one book at a time? Or I guess it's... <laughs> I'm not too sure. It For me, it's not that I set out to do that. Often what happens is I start a book um, or it's under contract and I'm writing it. And then a publisher will say, oh, what about this? And I'll look and say, oh, yeah, I could do that. And so I end up with um, books with two. Um, my YA and children's work is with um, Penguin Random House. And so often what happens is I have two different contracts. And so the two things cross over. The books will usually be at different stages. So one will be, I'll be editing one and just writing the other one. Um, or an idea comes calling like very, very insistently. And then I have to, then I have to pay attention. Yeah, it's your job as well as your, your calling. <laughs> you know? Yeah. 
Um, earlier, you had mentioned that you love, love, love murder mystery. You were going to talk more about that. Is there more that you want to say about that? Or Yeah, well, I think what I love about murder mysteries is, you know, they are a very, very popular thing. And I don't think it's because people are necessarily macabre or insensitive. I think that there is in us a drive to understand um, and to find resolution um, and a moral center. Um, and so what a murder mystery does is introduces you to the moral worldview of the detective, which I always find for, if it's good, satisfying and interesting. Um, and also life itself is very unwieldy. And right now life feels extremely <laughs> stressful and out of control. And in a murder mystery, it's actually under control. It goes out of control. And then somebody through their abilities and their insight and their intuition and their, uh, you know, expertise puts the world back in order. And that's so satisfying. Um, it's just a really satisfying thing to have chaos uh, turned into some kind of order. Um, so that is part of what I love about it. I love the detectives. I love their skill sets. Um, for cozies right now, for the last, you know, since we entered a pandemic, I, for the first time in my, since I learned to read, had a really hard time reading fiction. I, you know, I was just glued to the news. Mm -hmm. um, my attention span disappeared. I was writing, but I was having a lot of trouble with it, um, which slowed things down. And um, when I was finally, you know, I went on retreat after this, and it was so weird not to be able to read fiction the way I used to. Um, because I usually have two or three books going and I also have audio books going, like I always have lots of stories happening. Um, and I couldn't, you know, I was listening to upsetting podcasts and reading upsetting news. And so I went on retreat and sort of withdrew a little bit from the overwhelm of our contemporary world. And what I started again with the, with reading was cozies, um, the little cozy murder mysteries that have a little bit of funny in them. And where the world gets put right and i thought yes i think it's okay to retreat into this um because i think we need it and right now uh, cozies different kinds of cozies are having a real moment internationally um you know richard osman third state murder club and you know there's all kinds of cozies because people are looking for that they're looking for a little bit of a break um me too so me too yeah yeah here 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 um here there, there's a question that just going back thinking about the beginning of the pandemic uh and all the zoom calls that started i remember at the library one of the questions that was going around is with some of our writing and author groups is people are interested to know what sorts of snacks and beverages people were imbibing during their writing or zooming or you know shut down time are you someone who snacks away uh, when you're writing or you just leave that for your lunch break what uh, what do you consume ah uh, well you know i started my writing after i got off the bus i got a driver's license when i was 27 just <laughs> absolutely cutting edge um and i went to an all-night coffee shop uh where i would go before work because i worked as an editor so i would show up there around 6 6 30 right until i had to go to work and when I was in that coffee shop, I started, you know, I'd have a coffee, maybe two coffees. Um, and that's still, I sit down, when I sit down to write, there's a coffee, almost always, unless I do it at night. Um, and so I have to have that coffee. I can't ever quit coffee, apparently. Um, <laughs> it's just forever. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so always coffee. I don't snack. There's like one place in time in my day when I don't snack and that's while I'm writing. So maybe I should write a lot more because I do. Snacking, <laughs> is, snacking is another of my passions besides <laughs> butlering. <laughs> um, yeah, I, uh, I love to get my snack on, but uh, not while I'm writing. Um, I do tell people though, who are looking for like people who are trying to get over that hump of like getting to the page every day, like showing up to write is to give themselves a treat of some kind. Um, so that on some level, every time you sit down to write, there's a nice coffee or a tea or a dessert or whatever it is that makes you happy. Um, like make it a little bit fun, like make it a little bit a special thing. Even if you, you know, it feels like a grind, um, do absolutely add some kind of a treat for yourself because you deserve it if you're going to sit down and write. Fun and kind of a ritual little kind of an aspect to it. I think ritual, ritual is really important. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, oh, here's an interesting question, plot related question. 
uh, from our audience. Reading the book, it sounds like Edna had made a decision about plan A. Um, of course, Helen uh, had to fulfill plan B because as far as the world knew, Edna hadn't made a decision about plan A. Can you tell us anything more about this? Well, she was in the process of sorting things out herself, right? So she was trying to figure out what am I going to do? I have these parameters. I have to give the estate to one of these people. Um, so she was in that process. And then, um, of course, murdered, murdered. Um, and so she couldn't finish it, but it was there, like it was there it, well in her, you know, she was sorting it through. So it hadn't been, it wasn't something Helen could find out that's, you know, stealing the journals and all that sort of business. Um, so she was disrupted. Um, and I was kind of interested in this idea that um, Edna for all of her, uh, you know, Edna is a pretty, uh, I don't know what you'd call it. She's a pretty realized person in that, you know, she's very comfortable. She's been doing her practices for a long time, but she's very much a greedy type. And she's also a procrastinator. Um, and I thought that would be the worst. If you're a heavy, terrible procrastinator who on some level doesn't believe that you're ever going to die, even though you sort of, uh, you know, float around in this, oh, I love, I'm, I'm so comfortable with this. Um, to have your life stolen just as you're about to be clear about your wishes would be, I thought there was just a terrible little irony in that. Yeah. 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 Um, and that was another thing that I'm super interested in is, um, you know, wrinkle in the book is this death positive movement. Um, if anyone's interested in learning more about that, there are probably clubs in Richmond because um, there are clubs everywhere now, death positive clubs. Um, I read about it, I don't know, in New York Times or something. And it was a group of people who talk about what they want. They talk about what they expect. They were designing their own coffins. They were designing their own rituals. They were like, and they're like quite a social club, like, and they were all ages, like having a great time with this death positive stuff. Um, and I started reading work by, um, I think her name is Caitlin Doughty. Um, when smoke gets in your eyes, she's a mortician who is another person who's kind of popularized getting comfortable with your, your death and what you want for your death, what death looks like, et cetera. Um, so that I thought putting, having Edna in that world would, was a, huge red herring you know it allowed all kinds of confusion to happen and did that kind of grow naturally out of the fact that it's a murder mystery or is it because we're in that you know we've got the baby boomers who are entering their senior years did it evolve naturally how did that kind of bringing that death mortality theme into the book uh I think that uh you know I'm not sure exactly I knew quite early on that Edna was going to be death positive um, and that that would be part of what she was, you know, what she was all about. And the island itself, I thought was the kind of place that would have a lively death positive club. Um, there's one in Cumberland. There's one, you know, they're all up and down the island, um, people who have these meetings. And um, so, yeah, I just thought, given that she's what uh, my teacher who read the book for me, she's a greedy type. So in Buddhism, there's different types, right? So there's a, the greedy type who, and it's, it sounds mean, but it's not mean. It's just, you know, you want stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. um, the aversive type who's like, get it away from me. I don't like it. And then there's the deluded type where you're like, and often deluded people don't know quite what they want. They're like, oh, okay, sure. I'm not too sure. Okay. I think I like that. Um, so I thought Edna is a great combination of a greedy type. She likes things to be nice, but she's also a little deluded about herself. Like she's just floating through on this privileged life, not understanding that you're in the death positive club, but you have zero, um, understanding that you could, you know, you're actually going to die. Like, I think most of us are a bit like that. We're like, I'm very comfortable. No, I'm not. As long as it doesn't happen, I'm very comfortable with it. Yeah. <laughs> I really loved the Edna character. I loved and I loved how she was such a strong character throughout the book. Like you never forgot about our murder victim. Um, but it was kind of in a positive way. Just yeah, she was and very funny, the opening scenes where she's kind of patting herself, her, her ego uh, as if it's a, a cat, I think is the line. So um I love that char character. Um you know, someone's writing here, none of your characters are absolutely perfect or totally terrible. Is this something you're conscious of when writing to show the good and the bad in everyone? 
Yeah, I would say that's one of the my big drives. I don't, um, I mean, they do come off a little awful at the beginning, um, as a lot of my characters often do. But I hope that in the, over the process of the book, you uncover the good in them. Like all of them have good in them and you can see why people are the way they are. Um, you know, there are some people who, in murder mysteries where they're just like pure evil, um, which is great in a certain kind of book, but I'm more interested in the kind where they all have their dimensions and they are, you know, no matter how awful they are in their initial presentation, underneath they do things like look after their parents um, and try to please people. And, um, you know, I'm just also very interested in um, how we can come to have compassion for difficult people. Like I've been thinking about that a lot over the last several years um and it feels like and for me too it feels like compassion has just gotten really like there's just not a lot of it like people are like i'm so stressed i have no time to feel compassion for you and wherever you're coming from which is very different from where i'm coming from um and so i've gotten very interested in this idea that can we like open up again and see okay there's you know can we connect on that level again that is seems like the most important thing we can do. And if we can do it through a book, um, I, I find that really gratifying. Yeah, for sure. With the polarization that's going on and the, the social media kinds of, can't even really call them conversations. So yeah, very appreciated. Um, Mindful of Murder switches between an all-knowing narrator and chapters written by various characters in the first person. What was behind this decision? Yeah, so there, uh, the bulk of the book uh, that is focused on Helen is written in um, its uh, limited third. Is um, So it's like the focus is from scene to scene. We get Helen's perspective, but it's in a third person. Um, that point of view, uh, I often do, you know, I write a lot in first person, but that point of view, limited third or omniscient or whatever you're going to do, is um, it's a more... Uh, to use a Buddhist term, equanimous point of view. Like the way I've written it is it's just a more balanced point of view. You get sort of this calm insight and it's not as emotionally immediate as a first person thing where it's filtered very, very, you know, through the perceptions of an individual. So I thought the way Helen is, she's a pretty balanced customer. She's very <laughs> equanimous. Um, third person works and it also works for her to be understanding things and uh, it's just a good fit for her and then I introduced the first person narrations just because um, I wanted first of all a little bit of that sort of um, I don't know that uh, that excitement of a first person narrator and they have um, I hope they have fun voices um, where you get, where it's much more emotional, like it's much more turbulent, it's more emotional, it's more judgmental, it's all those kinds of things. And I wanted that for just the, the little bit of tone shift. Like Nigel, for instance, was really fun to write because he's, yeah. you know, he is who he is, um, but he's not trying to be equanimous. He's not balanced. He's completely judgy, but he's also quite sweet. Um, and the other ones have something to offer too with their first person narration. So I wanted to drop in a little bit of that first person. Yeah, and it was really entertaining to uh, have the the, uh, the first person narratives from Nigel and the Todd brothers um, and so on. So very enjoyable. Um, we're starting to edge to the end of our hour here, and this is um, a thematic question, but let's give it a shot. In Mindful of Murder, you write too much money or not enough, Helen thought, could probably accelerate a person's death. Can you discuss the theme of money in the novel? Yeah, um, so Helen has become, like it, it, Helen discovered when she was a monastic that she was very good at being with wealthy people. Um, Cause I'm not sure that everybody is. Um, and I'm not sure that uh, like extreme wealth, I think um, creates uh, like a bubble around people. Um, and so not everybody I think is able to sort of get in there with the bubble. And I think it does something kind of funky to people, um, to put it mildly. Like it's very hard to, if you are shielded from a lot of the material want that there are other people live with. I think it's, you know, you have to come at spiritual growth in a slightly different way. Um, and so too much money, I, you know, I think there's something to be said for having like a more modest amount of money. Um, it 
can I suspect it's very difficult to like be grounded if you are a wash in cash. And so that's one of the things that's really I found interesting about Edna is that she has all that money, which gives her stability. Um, she never has to worry her business is going to go under because she's a very, very, very wealthy woman. Um, but at the same time, um, she has set it aside and lives like a regular person. Um, so yeah, um, I think, and not having enough money is a very difficult thing. Like it's striving just for your basic needs is difficult. Um, yeah, I'm just very interested in the dynamics around money, what they do to our sense of generosity, um, what it does. Like some people are really, really good at being rich. They enjoy it. They're generous with it. And other people seem to contract around the money where it's never going to be enough. And it just like, you need more. And you can tell like the people who are really, it's not doing for them what they hoped it was going to do. They don't feel secure. They don't feel open and they feel under threat of losing any of it. You know, we have a lot of people doing a lot of harm in this world right now who are very, very, very wealthy people and it's never enough. And I'm just fascinated by that. Thank you. Can you describe the process of writing this book over a five or six year period? How do you decide when the novel is finally done? <laughs> well, when it's due. <laughs> <laughs> and my editor is like, where's my book? Um, so I, as I say, I took a lot, I was writing other stuff in there. And so I took a long time figuring out Helen. Um, and then it took me a while, like Helen's background and all that stuff. Once I had Helen sorted out, I'd had, you know, I had the sort of the frame butlers, uh, where it was going to be set. And then, you know, sort of the Buddhism and stuff. And then once I had all that stuff, it was relatively fast. Like it was about a year after, but it, I, you know, I did it over and over and over and over again. And my agent said, that's not it. That's not it. And then when I finally, you know, it just a, a few key pieces clicked into place, then I was able to write it much faster. So then I was able to write, um, every day and get it finished. Um, once they bought it, uh, I wrote the rest of it in like a year. Um, but it, the first hundred pages, just over and over and over, trying to get it sorted out. Um, you know, it's a kind of a difficult thing to come up with a detective now. There's a gazillion uh, murder mysteries and many, many fabulous uh, detectives. And to come up with something that felt sort of fresh to me um, took a while. Yeah. Yeah, it feels really fresh. She's just a really wonderful, wonderful character. Um, we just have a few minutes left before we come to the end of our hour. And we have a question uh, from an audience member. Hi, I'm a new fiction writer. What do you recommend as far as learning the craft? Formal courses, workshops, writing groups, etc. What have you done since you finished your undergraduate degree to further your craft? Um, can you, uh, tying us back to our, the beginning of your presentation, talking about uh, getting started in writing and some of your tips, what would you uh, suggest for our new fiction writer? Oh, okay, great. That's wonderful. Um, I would suggest trying any and all of those things and seeing what one works for you. So I started writing fiction without ever having taken a course. What I had done is read a lot of fiction, like read and read and read and read and read, and then been inspired by certain things and tried to learn from them. And so when I sat down to write, it was without any background, which made it like my editorial process challenging because I didn't know how to write a novel. Um, so, and after I had a, a novel, then I looked at some of, you know, I had a book and then I looked at some of the guides. Uh, and went, oh, okay, I can fix this and this and this. Um, and then I had what are called beta readers read it. Um, I have been teaching now for a long time. I teach um, at a university. And I what I see in my students is that a lot of them really benefit from the lessons on craft. They benefit from the community that they develop in the classroom. They benefit from learning how to edit each other's work. Um, and a lot of them leave with, you know, a project well underway. Some of them have finished books in our program, um, but they often will stick together in writing groups and support each other through the writing process because it's kind of a lonely, can be feel a little bit hopeless. Um, and so I think writing groups, uh, as long as they're healthy and you're with like simpatico people who understand what you're trying to write and um, and are kind and are, you know, have uh, good critical abilities that are still, um, you know, supportive and diplomatic. 
um, those could be, you know, not just for your writing, but for your life. Like having a nice writing group is a is a wonderful thing. And I see people in writing groups that have been in the same writing group for their whole careers. Um, and they just, you know, they lift each other up, um, but it can take a little while to form one of those groups. So, you know, give yourself a, try a one week intensive at a place like Hollyhock. There's all kinds of <laughs> neat things to, to do. But if, you know, if for some reason you can't do anything like that, write what you're going to write and then go read the books after. I love those suggestions. I love for I love the idea to just read, read, read. People come on to the library, read, read, read. Um, and also the writing groups and having beta readers. Susan, I know you've been a writer in residence, I believe, at one point. And uh, many libraries run them. Richmond Public Library has um, an annual writer in residence in conjunction with uh, the city of Richmond every fall. Um, so that's a good opportunity for people. Well, we have come to the end of our hour. It seems to have gone by very, very quickly. Susan, thank you so much for answering our questions and for your wonderful presentation and writing tips. And um, so thank you so much for joining us. Many thanks also go to Richmond Public Library's Chief Librarian, Susan Walters, and RPL's Library Board for their generous um, support of the program this evening. Uh, thank you also to the staff who were a part of this event. And thank you also to our audience members. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for joining us today. If you'd like to continue the discussion of Mindful of Murder, please go to RPL's Facebook group. Uh, it is called Richmond Reads Summer Book Club, and it'll be active until the end of this month. And as mentioned earlier, we will have a recording of today's discussion available in a few days. Uh, to view it, go to www.yourlibrary.ca and type in the word Susan Juby on our event calendar. Uh, thank you again, Susan, and thank you all for coming. Uh, take care. This concludes our presentation for this evening. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Hayley. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.